welcome to shankar's daily editorial analysis today's topic of discussion is these three editorials two editorials we have taken from the hindu newspaper and the third editorial we have taken from indian express and in the first editorial we will be discussing about the other act and what are the changes that can be made that will help in the forensics even more and in the second editorial a setback we will discuss about the japan and india relationship and how the recent election in japan is going to affect the india's interest and in the third editorial we will discuss about the importance of monuments and what are the legal backups available in india to preserve and protect the monuments before getting into the discussion i have an important announcement shankar ias academy is conducting a prelims test series known as pre storming which consists of almost 48 tests the third batch is going to start from 21st november you can enroll in this test series by clicking in the link given below in the description and without further delay let's get into today's discussion this is the first editorial that we are going to discuss today the basic crux of this editorial is that there is a forgotten historical site in delhi called as anantal and they have totally forgotten to preserve and promote this historical site so we will make use of this editorial to understand the importance of monuments and what are the legal backups available in india to protect and preserve these monuments so first let's start with the main question what are the social and historical importance of monumental preservation in india and how digitalization enhance the preservation technique of these historical sites these are the question we are given with you can write the answer for this question and post it in the comment section we will review it for you so what are monuments it is a structure or building which is created to commemorate a person or a event or a significant historical or a cultural aspect so and usually they serve as a symbol of heritage and memory and that is why it is an important aspect with respect to a history of a nation this is the monument and now we will see what are the provisions available in india for the protection of these monuments the first and the foremost act which, which we have is the the ancient monuments and the archaeological sites and remains act this act was enacted in the year 1958 so what are the provisions of this act the main aim of this act is to protect the monuments as well as archaeological sites which are having a national importance and it is mandating that the central government is having a power to declare any site be it as historical artifact archaeological as a protected monument so the central government is having a power to declare in any spot as a protected monument it is also having a power to establish a prohibited area and this prohibited area is about 100 meters around the protected monuments and in this protected area there can be no new construction and there is another area called as regulated area which is about 200 meters from the monument the basic aim of these protected area and the prohibited area and the regulated area is that to protect the monuments from any damage and any alteration or destruction and encroachment in these areas are prohibited it is also criminalizing any damage which is done to the monuments and in the year 2010 an amendment was introduced and in this amendment a stricter regulation and guidelines were introduced for any violation which is done with respect to this act these are the main provisions of this act with respect to this you have to remember about the regulated area prohibited area next we have an important authority known as the national monuments authority and this is established on the previous act which we discussed the main aim of this authority is to oversee any activity around the protected monuments and they will enforce the provisions which are given in the above act so they have the power to grant or deny permission for construction in this protected area next we have the archaeological survey of india it is working under the ministry of culture the main aim and the responsibility of this archaeological survey of india is to maintain the protected monuments so how do they do this they will conduct surveys excavations and conservation work on these monuments and sites to protect the monuments they also conduct research and documentation along with it they will also conduct various awareness campaigns to educate the people about the importance of this monuments 
So you might have heard about the UNESCO. So the ASI is collaborating with this UNESCO for the purpose of identification, maintenance and the preservation of the world heritage sites which are located in India. This is the main function of the Archaeological Survey of India. Next, we have a site cities network which is the Indian Heritage Cities Network. The main function of this network is to promote the preservation of the monuments. How do they do this? Is this? So, this Indian Heritage Cities Network will partner with the local government, NGOs as well as private organization and will help in the promotion of the preservation of the monuments. This is the function of the Indian Heritage Cities Network. Talking about the international recognition and commitments, India is a signatory of the UNESCO World Heritage Convention which happened in the year 1972. So, according to this convention, India is committed to protect the natural as well as cultural heritage monuments in India. So, under this various campaigns, awareness and funding is done to conserve the monuments. These are the legal provisions that are available to preserve the monuments in India. So, now we will see what are the challenges in preservation of monuments in India. First is the urbanization. There is a rapid urbanization in India because there is a growing population which is leading to encroachment especially around these monuments. Because of this, there is a huge pollution and traffic also uh, increased construction around these areas, this can threaten the structure and the aesthetic value of the monuments which are located in India. So, this is the first reason urbanization and the encroachment is the first challenge and second we have the environmental and the climate change. There are many causes such as the air pollution, the acid rain and many changing weather patterns. This can affect the structure of the monument such as the acid rain is affecting the Taj Mahal located in Agra, it can cause discoloration and even erode the material which is present in the monuments. This is also a major challenge in preserving the monuments. And third, there is a tourism pressure. Yes, tourism is beneficial to India to improve the economy and other aspects, but because of major overcrowding, this can even cause physical damage to the monuments and it can and it can even cause vandalism and improper waste disposal if they are not maintained properly. And the next challenge would be resource and funding constraints. Say for preserving any monuments, you need a restoration technique, a skilled labor to do the work and the continuous maintenance is required to do the, to do the preservation. But in case of India, we have a limited funding that too, it is highly challenging for the state as well as local governments to implement these actions. So, the budget constraint is another major challenge in preserving the monuments. And lastly, we have the vandalism and theft. Tourists usually tend to damage the monuments by doing some kind of graffiti or even damaging the monuments. This can severely affect the structure of the monuments. Also, there is a weak enforcement of laws and inadequate security measures which are allowing the process to continue again and again. So, what can be done to face these challenges is that one is the responsibility of the citizens. Each citizen has to be responsible of their own to respect the monuments and act accordingly. And next, we can follow the sustainable tourism. How we can do this uh, is that we can limit the number of visitors. We can improve the process such as the waste management. We can also build some eco-friendly infrastructure around the heritage sites. And this initiative will help to preserve the monuments and maintain them efficiently. So, these are the ideas that you have to understand with respect to the monuments. And in this discussion, we saw what are monuments and what are the legal backup present in India to preserve the monuments and what are the challenges. With this, we will conclude the discussion on this editorial and now let us move on to the next one. Take a look at this editorial. This editorial is taken from the Hindu newspaper. The main crux of this editorial is that we have the UIDAI, which is the Unique Identification Authority of India. They are enforcing a strict privacy with respect to the Aadhaar data. So, what they are doing is that they are prohibiting the use of this Aadhaar data by the police as well as other authority to access this biometric information because the core uh, information with respect to this Aadhaar Act is to protect the biometric information to 
protect the privacy of the people but there is a revaluation required on these restrictions according to this editorial because this might help in the forensics this is the main crux of this editorial with this let's see what is the aadhar act and what is uidai so let's start with the main question discuss the challenges and considerations in allowing access to biometric data for the forensic purposes in india we have to balance the privacy and the investigative needs this is the question we are given with so now let's see what is uidai so this authority is established under the ministry of electronics and information technology and it is a statutory authority the main responsibility of this authority is to issue the unique aadhar number to the residents of india they also enforce the strict data privacy because they want to safeguard the individual privacy and wanted to prevent the misuse of the aadhar data but the certain sections in the aadhar act is allowing the disclosure of data in a limited manner so let's see about the aadhar act now so all the residents of india are eligible to get the aadhar number by providing the demographic and the biometric information of themselves as you know each aadhar number is unique to an individual and they are generated randomly and this number is unrelated to any personal attributes or the identity of the individual as already said the uidai will ensure the data privacy and protection and they will implement all the necessary safeguards to ensure this protection so under this act the aadhar number and the related information cannot be disclosed publicly except under some conditions for example we have the section 33 you need not remember the number of this section you just need to understand the provisions which are present in this act first this provision is prohibiting the disclosure of information except when it is an order of the district judge or an high court so under their order they have to disclose the information and under 33 clause sub clause 2 provision of this act it is providing the disclosure of information in the interest of the national security only when it is directed by the officer of the joint secretary or an higher rank so this is with respect to the national security of the country and in, under section 47 we have the we have the provision for the cognizance of an offence only on the complaint by the uidai and under the last session which is the 57 of the aadhar act this act is providing a use of the aadhar number to establish an individual identity for the purpose of the state or any corporation talking about the penalties for the unauthorized access if someone is having a unauthorized access to the aadhar database they can be imprisoned up to 3 years and a minimum fine of about 10 lakhs in amount so now let's see how this aadhar data can be beneficial in case of the forensics suppose if a person is having a access to or an authority is having an access to the fingerprint data in case of any unidentified bodies or the deceased bodies it will be helpful for the investigation and to support the right to dignity of an individual the courts are also emphasizing the humane treatment of bodies this will advocate for the timely procedures and report because a justice delayed is a justice denied so the timely deliver of the report using the biometric data will be beneficial especially with respect to the marginalized groups in india and usually the major challenge is that the unidentified bodies often belong to the disadvantaged so uh, individuals of the society making the identification even more challenging these are the now let's see what are the limitations that are existing in the current aadhar act and why there is a need for the revaluation as already seen this aadhar act is restricting the sharing the core biometric data and this can create challenge in identifying the deceased individual or the unidentified bodies so and if we compare with other countries such as we take the us there the law enforcement can use the biometric data to identify and match the deceased individuals by using many advanced technology such as the fingerprint matching technology but here we can't use that information so by revaluating the aadhar act we can 
access the di diseased individuals uh, biometric data and we can improve the identification process and provide the dignity and justice to the deceased family by reevaluating this act we can provide the justice without violating the constitution norms and another solution is that we can allow the lower level judiciary that is local judicial magistrates rather than only allowing the higher courts to prove to give access to the biometric data in the other so by providing the power and authority to the local judicial magistrate we can reduce the burden on the higher judiciary so on the whole identifying the diseased individual is a constitutional responsibility and to ensure the dignity of the individual as well as the family so there is a revaluation re required for this act to uphold these rights that, that we mentioned especially with respect to the marginalized and the disadvantaged section of the society by this way we will be able to ensure the equal dignity to all the citizens in the india so in this discussion we saw what is uidai what is other act and what are the provisions and why there is a revaluation required to give justice to the deceased section and why there is a revaluation of the act required that will help in the foreign six with this we'll conclude the discussion on this editorial and now let's move on to the next one take a look at this next editorial recently election took place in japan and the ruling party has lost its majority it is expected that this could weaken the japan's role in international as well as they can also delay the important projects such as uh, the bullet train projects with india also the regional rivals of japan such as the north korea south korea china and russia can also see this as a chance to challenge the defense plans of the japan under the new prime minister shigeru ishiba this is the crux of the editorial what we are going to discuss with respect to this editorial is that we are going to discuss the main or the key relationship strategic relationship between japan and india and how the recent election results can affect the interest of india let's start the discussion with the question first in the context of growing multilateralism discuss how india and japan's collaboration in organizations such as quad and asian can serve as a counterbalance to chinese influence in the region this is the question we have to answer let's start with the strategic partnership between china and japan start talking about the india and japan first we have to discuss about the free and open indo pacific region so this is an initiative which will which will ensure the peace stability and prosperity in the indo pacific region the main vision of this free and open indo pacific is to ensure that all countries will operate under shared international rules and it will promote the freedom of navigation in the indo pacific region by this way we will be able to promote the stability transparency in the indo pacific region that's why india and japan are collaborating on various military exercise one such example is the gmex and another we have the malabar exercise and the veer guardian is also a bilateral air exercise which is conducted between india and japan also we have the 2 plus 2 ministerial dialogue framework this is nothing but it is a high level diplomatic and a defense dialogue between both the countries which will involve many foreign and defense ministers among the two countries so under this framework the foreign and the defense minister will discuss on many important issues with respect to the foreign policy defense cyber security and other issues by conducting the discussion under this framework we will be able to enhance the strategic cooperation between both the countries which will help us to strengthen the security and the economic ties between them talking about the economic ties between both the countries you have to know that in the japan is one of the largest investor in india because they have committed to invest almost 37 billion dollars over a span of 5 years starting from 2022 they are going to invest in various infrastructure projects especially under a infrastructure project called as the partnership for the quality infrastructure for example we have the high speed rail development and the smart city initiatives these are the joint initiatives and projects which are undertaken by the japan and india collaboratively under the sepa which is the comprehensive 
economic partnership agreement which will enable and boost the economic ties between both these countries the bilateral trade has reached almost 20.57 billion dollars and this enhancement of the bilateral trade is because of the agreements which they signed so next we'll discuss about the technological and the industrial collaboration between both the countries both these countries are collaborating on various emerging technologies such as uh, semiconductors quantum computing and the artificial intelligence they are also collaborating on you also have to understand that japan is actively involving in the act east policy of india which is a policy which is designed by in so act east policy is nothing but it is a diplomatic and a economic strategy which is designed by india the main focus of this act east policy is to strengthen the ties with the southeast asian as well as east asian countries so under this policy we will build a strong relationship be it economic strategic or cultural relationship we will build a strong relationship with the southeast and the east asian countries this is the main objective of the act east policy and japan is involving in this policy of india also you have to know that japan and india have signed various mou with respect to the higher education the skill development and the cultural education cultural exchange programs this will help us to boost the culture education language and the professional exchange between both the countries so these are some key ideas or the areas we have to understand with respect to the india and japan relationship now we will see what will be the effect of the result of the election that has took place in japan even though there is a change in the power in japan we are expecting that there will be a continue in the indo pacific strategy there might be a temporary delay in the project but it is expected that the projects will continue smoothly india is also expecting a deeper bilateral engagement in the sectors such as uh, defense and the critical infrastructure which will strengthen both the countries position in in the asia under the new prime minister it is expected that with respect to the india and japan defense ties especially with respect to the quad and the asean we may see a sustained or even enhanced support between both the countries these are the potential impact because of the change in the result of the japan election with this let's conclude the discussion on this editorial and we have come to end of today's video if you found the video informative do hit like give your feedback says comment and don't forget to subscribe thank you have a nice day